Hello, fifth graders, and welcome to Language Arts for today. Uh, for today, you will need your copy of Little Women and potentially, again, that paper pencil if you're writing down answers as you go. I There's a lot of short answers for today's assignment, so I would encourage um, everyone to do this, even just to write down page numbers for where you're going to find quotes. Um, or post-it notes. Some people have been using post-it notes to kind of mark where they're going to go back and find quotes in their answer. So, um, so yeah, with that. So remember, fifth graders, um, I have been giving comments about your homework. So make sure you're reading those comments because we're not going through the answers together. Um, but if you're uncertain about any of the comments that I'm making, then you should go ahead and come see me during office hours. I'm happy to talk to you about the text or you can write me a question and we can write back and forth. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and do that. So for today, our objective is going to be characterizing the girls. You should remember that at the end of the last, or in the last chapter, we found out that Mr. March is ill and that Marmy has gone and Mr. Brooke is sort of escorting her to Washington, D.C. in order to see her husband and try to care for him. Um, so today's chapter is really looking at some letters that have been written by the people who are back at home writing to Marmy and to Mr. March as well. So let's take a look at our questions together for today, and then we'll get into our reading. Oh, bumpy, I'm sorry. Goodness. Okay, so you'll see the first four questions are very similar. What is one quote from Meg's letter that captures her character? So remember that answer, we'd say one quote from Meg's letter that captures her character is... And just like when we were reading the Pickwick portfolio, your answer shouldn't be, love Meg, okay? That doesn't really characterize Meg. It just shows that you know what her name is, okay? So you want to actually pick something from the text that captures her. Maybe it's something that she's writing about, the topic. That's something that she'd be interested in. Maybe it's the way that she's writing. Maybe it's the things that she's focusing on in her letter. So you want to think about what do we see in this letter that makes you think, yeah, Okay, that sounds like Meg, okay? You're gonna do it for all of the girls, Joe, Beth, and Amy, and again, restating every time, one quote from Joe's letter that captures her character is, one quote from Beth's letter that captures her character is, one quote from Amy's letter that captures her character is. Remember, when we were doing this with the Pickwork portfolio, we were thinking about things like how they write or spell things, the types of words that they use, the, the tone in their voice, um, the topic, the things that they're writing about, the things that they mention that we know are things that those girls are interested in. Okay, so make sure we are not saying because it says love Joe, right? Be more specific in terms of what you know about Joe and her character. Okay. Number five asks from Hannah's letter, we learn that Mr. March is sick with what? And then number six is a vocabulary word, solace. So which of the following sentences correctly uses that word, solace? So just six questions today, okay? But four of them are asking you to identify quotes to support uh, what we know about the girls' characters, okay? Okay, so let's go ahead and get into it. We're on page 166 in the text. Again, your eyes should be following along in the text while you're listening to me. That's what's going to help you and to improve your reading skills as you go. And again, I would be, once we get into the letters, I'd start writing things down to help you to remember as you're going back and trying to answer these questions. So chapter 16, letters. In the cold gray dawn, the sisters lit their lamp and read their chapter with an earnestness never felt before. For now, the shadow of a real trouble had come. The little books were full of help and comfort. And as they dressed, they agreed to say goodbye cheerfully and hopefully and send their mother on her anxious journey, unsaddened by tears or complaints from them. Remember, this book is in reference to what Marmy gave them for Christmas or earlier in the year. And these are um, the Bible, which would have been the religious or is the religious book for people who are Christian, which the Marches are Christian. Everything seemed very strange when they went down, so dim and still outside, so full of light and bustle within. Breakfast at this early hour seemed odd, and even Hannah's familiar face looked unnatural as she flew about her kitchen with her nightcap on. The big trunk stood ready in the hall. Mother's cloak and bonnet lay on the sofa, and Mother herself sat trying to eat, but looking so pale and worn with sleeplessness and anxiety that the girls found it very hard to keep their resolution, meaning their resolution not to cry. They're having a tough time not crying. 
Meg's eyes kept filling in spite of herself. Joe was obliged to hide her face in the kitchen roller more than once, and the little girls wore a grave, troubled expression, as if sorrow was a new experience to them. Nobody talked much, but as the time drew very near and they sat waiting for the carriage, Mrs. March said to the girls, who were all busied about her, one folding her shawl, another smoothing out the strings of her bonnet, a third putting on her overshoes, and a fourth fastening up her travel bag. Children, I leave you to Hannah's care and Mr. Lawrence's protection. Hannah is faithfulness itself, and our good neighbor will guard you as if you were his own, as if you were his own, excuse me. I have no fears for you, yet I am anxious that you should take this trouble rightly. Don't grieve and fret when I am gone, or think that you can comfort yourselves by being idle and trying to forget. Go on with your work as usual, for work is a blessed solace. Hope and keep busy, and whatever happens, remember that you can never be fatherless. So she's encouraging the girls in this time of theirs to make sure that they are staying busy because that's what she is telling is going to help them get through the time with less anxiousness is having work to do and staying committed to the things that they should be working on. Yes, mother. Meg, dear, be prudent. Watch over your sisters. Consult Hannah and in any perplexity, go to Mr. Lawrence. Be patient, Joe. Don't get despondent or do rash things. Write to me often and be my brave girl, ready to help and cheer us all. Beth, comfort yourself with your music and be faithful to little home duties. And you, Amy, help all you can, be obedient, and keep happy, safe at home. We will, mother, we will. The rattle of an approaching carriage made them all start and listen. That was the hard minute, but the girls stood it well. No one cried, no one ran away or uttered a lamentation, though their hearts were very heavy as they sent loving messages to father, remembering as they spoke that it might be too late to deliver them. So again, the narrator is referring to potentially it being too late. So what does that mean if it's too late for father to receive their, their letters? Yeah, this is about the fact that he could be gravely ill, he could be dying or have already died. And again, this is a time when information doesn't travel as quickly, right? A telegraph would have been the fastest way to communicate. But um, it's not like they pick up a phone and can hear if something has happened. So they're all, there's always a delay between whatever has happened or is happening and when they find out about it, if there's a long distance between them. They kissed their mother quietly, clung about her tenderly, and tried to wave their hands cheerfully when she drove away. Lori and his grandfather came over to see her off, and Mr. Brook looked so strong and sensible and kind that the girls christened him Mr. Greatheart on the spot, which is, again, another character of Pilgrim's Progress, so they're kind of comparing him to this character. Goodbye, my darlings. God bless and keep us all, whispered Mrs. March, as she kissed one dear little face after the other and hurried into the carriage. As she rolled away, the sun came out, and looking back, she saw it shining on the group at the gate like a good omen. They saw it also and smiled and waved their hands, and the last thing she beheld as she turned the corner was the four bright faces, and behind them, like a bodyguard, old Mr. Lawrence, faithful Hannah, and devoted Lori. How kind everyone is to us, she said, turning to find fresh proof of it in the respectful sympathy of the young man's face. I don't see how they can help it, returned Mr. Brooke, laughing so infectiously that Mrs. March could not help smiling. And so the long journey began with the good omens of sunshine, smiles, and cheerful words. I feel as if there had been an earthquake, said Joe, as their neighbors went home to breakfast, leaving them to rest and refresh themselves. It seems as if half the house was gone, added Meg forlornly. Beth opened her lips to say something, but could only point to the pile of nicely mended hose which lay on Mother's table, showing that even in her last hurried moments she had thought and worked for them. It was a little thing, but it went straight to their hearts, and in spite of their brave resolutions, they all broke down and cried bitterly. Hannah wisely allowed them to relieve their feelings, and when the shower showed signs of clearing up, she came to the rescue, armed with a coffee pot. Now, my dear young ladies, remember what your ma said, and don't fret. Come and have a cup of coffee all round, and then let's fall to work and be a credit to the family. Coffee was a treat, and Hannah showed great tact in making it that morning. No one could resist her persuasive nods or the fragrant invitation issuing from the nose of the coffee pot, 
They drew up to the table, exchanged their handkerchiefs for napkins, and in 10 minutes, we're all right again. Hope and keep busy. That's the motto for us. So let's see who will remember it best. I shall go to Aunt Marge as usual. Oh, won't she lecture, though, said Joe as she sipped with a returning spirit. I shall go to my king's, though I'd much rather stay at home and attend to things here, said Meg, wishing she hadn't made her eyes so red. No need of that. Beth and I can keep house perfectly well, put in Amy with an important air. Hannah will tell us what to do, and we'll have everything nice when you come home, added Beth, getting out her mop and dish, pens and mop and dish tub without delay. Excuse me. I think anxiety is very interesting, observed Amy, eating sugar pensively. The girls couldn't help laughing and felt better for it, though Meg shook her head at the young lady who could find consolation in a sugar bowl. The sight of the turnovers made Joe sober again, and when the two went out to their daily tasks, they looked sorrowfully back at the window where they were accustomed to see their mother's face. It was gone, but Beth had remembered the little household ceremony, and there she was nodding away at them like a rosy-faced mandarin. That's so like my Beth, said Joe, waving her hat with a grateful face. Goodbye, Maggie. I hope the kings won't train today. Drag or t trail. So kind of like if she's teaching them and they're dragging, it means she has to work extra hard. Don't fret about father, dear, she added as they parted. And I hope Aunt March won't croak. Your hair is becoming, and it looks very boyish and nice, returned Meg, trying not to smile at the curly head, which looked comically small on her tall sister's shoulders. That's my only comfort. And touching her hat a la Lori, away went Joe, feeling like a shorn sheep on a wintry day. News from their father comforted the girls very much, for though dangerously ill, the presence of the best and tenderest of nurses had already done him good. Mr. Brooks sent a bulletin every day, and as the head of the family, Meg insisted on reading the dispatches, which grew more and more cheering as the week passed. At first, everyone was eager to write, and plump envelopes were carefully poked into the letterbox by one or the other of the sisters, who felt rather important with their Washington correspondence. As one of these packets contained characteristic notes from the party, we will rob an imaginary mail and read them. So the narrator is telling us that this particular set of notes is characteristic of the girls. And so we, our job now is to figure out why. And again, your answer can't be just that the letter was signed Meg. And so we know it's Meg. Instead, we're trying to figure out how we can characterize the girls by picking a quote. So think about in this first letter, for instance, what does Meg write about that sounds like Meg? Or how does Meg write that sounds like Meg? Okay. So let's give it a shot and we'll see how we do. My dearest mother, it is impossible to tell you how happy your last letter made us, for the news was so good we couldn't help laughing and crying over it. How very kind Mr. Brooke is, and how fortunate that Mr. Lawrence's business detains him near you so long, since he is so useful to you and father. The girls are all as good as gold. Joe helps me with the sewing and insists on doing all sorts of hard jobs. I should be afraid she might overdo if I didn't know that her moral fit wouldn't last long. Beth is as regular about her tasks as a clock and never forgets what you told her. She grieves about father and looks sober except when she is at her little piano. Amy minds me nicely and I take great care of her. She does her own hair and I am teaching her to make buttonholes and mend her stockings. She tries very hard, and I know you will be pleased with her improvement when you come. Mr. Lawrence watches over us like a motherly old hen, as Joe says, and Lori is very kind and neighborly. He and Joe keep us merry, for we get pretty blue sometimes and feel like orphans with you so far away. Hannah is a perfect saint. She does not scold at all and always calls me Miss Margaret, which is quite proper, you know, and treats me with respect. We are all well and busy, but we long day and night to have you back. Give my dearest love to Father, and believe me, ever your own, Meg. So what do we know about Meg that might be a quote that would show us a little bit about her character? I mean, I'm thinking about the fact that she's very motherly, sometimes kind of... Um, bossy or luxury with the other girls. There's some other things in there, which I'm not going to say much about, but 
perhaps you're thinking about and seeing evidence that you're thinking, I know this is Meg because. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here we go. This note, prettily written on scented paper, was a great contrast to the next, which was scribbled on a big sheet of thin foreign paper ornamented with blots and all manner of flourishes and curly-tailed letters. Even that paragraph is a little bit indicative. So now we're on to Joe. So what about Joe's character do we see here? My precious Marmy, three cheers for dear father. Brooke was a trump to telegraph right off and let us know the minute he was better. I rushed up Garrett when the letter came and tried to thank God for being so good to us, but I could only cry and say, I'm glad, I'm glad. Didn't that do as well as a regular prayer? For I felt a great many in my heart. We have such funny times, and now I can enjoy them, for everyone is so desperately good. It's like cat living in a nest of turtle doves. You'd laugh to see Meg head the table and try to be motherish. She gets prettier every day, and I'm in love with her sometimes. That's kind of Joe being silly, right? And I think we know that Joe is increasingly protective of Meg as Meg seems to be getting older, and there's definitely more whisperings or rumblings of romance for Meg, and so Joe is becoming kind of increasingly pr protective of her. Um, so not, I mean, she's saying she loves her a lot, right? The children are regular archangels and I, well, I'm Joe and she'll never be anything else. Oh, I must tell you that I came near having a quarrel with Lori. I freed my mind about a silly little thing and he was offended. I was right, but didn't speak as I ought. And he marched home saying he wouldn't come again till I begged pardon. I declared I wouldn't and got mad. It lasted all day. I felt bad and wanted you very much. Lori and I are both so proud, it's hard to beg pardon. But I thought he'd come to it, for I was in the right. He didn't come, and just at night I remembered what you said when Amy fell into the river. I read my little book, felt better, resolved not to let the sun set on my anger, and ran over to tell Lori I was sorry. I met him at the gate, coming for the same thing. We both laughed, begged each other's pardon, and felt all good and comfortable again. I made a poem yesterday when I was helping Hannah wash, and as father likes my silly little things, I put it in to amuse him. Give him the lovingest hug that ever was, and kiss yourself a dozen times for your topsy-turvy Joe. I think there's lots of evidence in that um, letter that would characterize Joe, so picking one quote that would characterize her. And here's her poem. A song from the Suds. Queen of my tub, I merrily sing while the white foam rises high and sturdily wash and rinse and wring and fasten the clothes to dry. Then out in the free fresh air they swing under the sunny sky. I wish we could wash from our hearts and souls the stains of the week away and let our water and air by their magic make ourselves as pure as they. Then on the earth there would be indeed a glorious washing day. Along the path of a useful life will heartsease ever bloom. The busy mind has no time to think of sorrow or care or gloom. And anxious thoughts may be swept away as we bravely wield a broom. I am glad a task to me is given to labor at day by day. For it brings me health and strength and hope and I cheerfully learn to say. Head you may think, heart you may feel, but hand you shall work all way. Dear Mother, there was only room for me to send my love and some pressed pansies from the root I have been keeping safe in the house for father to see. I read every morning, try to be good all day, and sing myself to sleep with father's tune. I can't sing Land of the Leal now. It makes me cry. Everyone is kind, and we are as happy as we can be without you. Amy wants the rest of the page, so I must stop. I didn't forget to cover the holders, and I wind the clock and air the rooms every day. Kiss dear father on the cheek he calls mine. Oh, do come soon to your loving little Beth. So one thing I think about Ruth Beth is that she is always thinking of others. So that's kind of my hint for you as you're thinking about a quote for what, how to characterize Beth. Ma, Sherry, mama. We are all well. I do my lessons always and never corroborate the girls. Meg says I mean contradict. So I put both in words and you can take the properest I put in both. Meg is a great comfort to me and lets me have jelly every night at tea. It's so good for me, Joe says, because it keeps me sweet tempered. 
Flory is not as respectful as he ought to be. Now I am almost in my teens. He calls me chicken, hurts my feelings by talking French to me very fast when I say merci or bonjour as Hattie King does. The sleeves of my blue dress were all worn out and Meg put in new ones, but the full front came wrong and they are more blue than the dress. I felt bad but did not fret. I bear my troubles well, but I do wish Hannah would put more starch in my aprons and have buckwheats every day. Can't she? Didn't I make that interrogation point nice? Meg says my punctuation and spelling are disgraceful, and I am mortified, but dear me, I have so many things to do I can't stop. Adieu, I send heaps of love to Papa. Your affectionate daughter, Amy Curtis March. So lots to think about with Amy there. A lot of quotes that could capture her. I am eager to see what you pick there. Okay, this next letter is from Hannah. And remember that question five is asking what Mr. March is sick with. So I would be paying attention to that question here. Dear Miss March, I just dropped a line to say we get on first rate. The girls is clever and fly around right smart. Miss Meg is going to make a proper good housekeeper. She has the liking for it and gets the hang of things surprise and quick. Joe does beat all for going ahead, but she don't stop to calculate first. And you never know where she's like to bring up. She done out a tub of clothes on Monday, but she starched them before they was wrenched and blued a pink calico dress till I thought I should have died a laughing. Beth is the best of little creatures and a sight of help to me, being so forehanded and, de and dependable. She tries to learn everything and really does goes to market beyond her years. Likewise keeps accounts with my help. Quite wonderful. We have got on very economical so far. I don't let the girls have coffee only once a week, according to your wish, and keep them on plain wholesome vittles. Amy does well about fretting, wearing her best clothes and eating sweet stuff. Mr. Laurie is full of dedos as usual. So pranks, she's saying that Laurie's over pranking a lot. And turns the house upside down frequent. But he heartens up the girls, so I let him have full swing. The old gentleman sends heaps of things and is rather wearing, but he means well, and it ain't my place to say nothing. My bread is riz, so no more at this time. I send my duty to Mr. March and hope he's seen the last of his pomonia. Yours respectful, Hannah Mullet. So she calls it pomonia. That's kind of a big hint for how, um, for what he has um, from the options that you'd select. Okay. But uh, pneumonia, okay, this is like when you get an infection in your lungs and there's just a fluid in there and it causes, it can be really harmful if not caught earlier or if there's issues kind of help or preventing you from fighting it really well from your body fighting it. Head nurse of ward number two, all serene on the Rappenhanock. Troops in fine condition, commissary department well conducted. The Ohm Guard under Colonel Teddy always on duty. Commander-in-Chief General Lawrence reviews the Army daily. Quartermaster Mullet keeps order in camp, and Major Lyon does picket duty at night. A salute of 24 guns was fired on receipt of good news from Washington, and a dress parade took place at headquarters. Commander-in-Chief sends best wishes, in which he is heartily joined by Colonel Teddy. So this is Laurie, right? And remember, his name is Theodore, so sometimes he goes by Teddy, and this is kind of his humorous note. Dear Madam, the little girls are all well. Beth and my boy report daily. Hannah is a model servant and guards pretty Meg like a dragon. Glad the fine weather holds. Pray make Brooke useful and draw on me for funds if expenses exceed your estimate. Don't let your husband want anything. Thank God he is mending. Your sincere friend and servant, James Lawrence. Okay, so we should have a pretty good idea of answers for characterizing the girls, right? And remember, we're looking for a quote that really kind of shows something that we know about them, something that they like, something that they think about, a way in which they speak, a way in which they treat others, um, some kind of a quote that will capture them in their letters. And again, it shouldn't just be a name. It should be something more about their characters, right? Their name is not their character. It's just what they're called. So think about their characters, okay? Um, yeah, let me know if you have questions or if you want to chat more about this. Um, I'm looking forward to reading your answers, fifth graders.